morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. We take, we've taken a break from studying about what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse to focusing on the Easter account, because that's what this holiday season is all about. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 14, And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Why? Because this is what our entire, I hate to call it, religion, but our relationship with Christ is based upon. Years ago, Joshua McDowell made the statement and wrote an article with the title, um, Lord, Liar, Lunatic. And my God, those words are a little out of order. But the concept was this. Either Jesus Christ was a liar and he was not who he said he was. Either he was a lunatic and really thought he was somebody he really wasn't. Or he truly was Lord. And the fact that he died on the cross for our sins, anyone can die. But the fact that he rose again from the grave on the third day, just like he said he would, is what validates or gives proof to the fact that he truly was the Son of God. And that's what we're looking at and focusing on here in the next couple of weeks and even last week. And what we were doing is we're going to look at it in several different ways. And we started looking at prophecy. And if we go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms, in Psalm chapter 22, over 500 years before crucifixion was even uh, invented, we have the psalmist David recording the crucifixion of the Messiah in Psalm 22. And not just the crucifixion of the Messiah, but right there in Psalm chapter 22, 23, and 24, David lays right out the three offices of Christ. That of prophet, which he was in his earthly ministry. That of him as priest, our high priest, which he is right now. And him as Lord in Psalm chapter 24, which he will be after the tribulation period, when he comes back and sits on the throne of his seat, Father David. And we looked at many prophecies last week concerning him being betrayed by a close friend, being sold for 30 pieces of silver, how he was silent before those who are accusing him, how he was pierced, and how his body would not see decay or would not return to the dust of the earth. But rather, something would happen before then. We're going to go ahead. And before I forget, does everybody have the little chart that was out there last week? Does everybody have the chart that's out with the notes last week? It has a cup in the middle. This one? Yes, that one. That is the one because we'll be using that one today. But we're going to finish up some prophecy. And we're going to skip ahead to page 3. And point 4. And we are going to talk about the resurrection in prophecy. If someone would please read Matthew chapter 20, verses 7 through 19. Matthew 20, 17 through 19. I'll get Matthew 27. Does someone have Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19? They're going to take me captive. They're going to take me as a prisoner. They're going to 
They're going to beat me. They're going to scourge me. And then when they're done, they're going to crucify me. However, I will arise again the third day. There are many other passages listed after that. Mark 14, 58, Matthew 26, 61, John chapter 2, verse 19. On many occasions, we find that Jesus told his disciples, you know what? They're going to kill me, but I'm going to rise again the third day. And it's not just one time he told that, that but he told them multiple times throughout his ministry. They're go I'm going to destroy this temple, and on the third day, I'm going to rebuild it. What's Christ referring to? He's referring to his death and resurrection. Multiple times, Christ told his disciples, he's going to die, but he's going to rise again the third day. In the words of Joshua right now, either he was a lunatic, either he was a liar, or he truly was Lord. And we find in Matthew chapter 27, 29 to 31, that he truly was Lord. Where the Bible reads, And when they had plowed a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him, and they took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off of him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified. Why do I get the feel of this not right? I must have put the wrong verses on there. In verse 40, we have him saying, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. What does chapter 28 look like? Let's go back. But in Matthew chapter 28, we do have the fulfillment of that, so I don't know if you want to write that in your notes. Because we have Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb, finding it empty, and she mistakes him for the garden. And of course, we can list many other passages along there from other books as well, where the women came to the tomb and found it empty. So I don't know what I was thinking there in that passage. Maybe I got it a little out of whack. I think it was supposed to be before fulfilled, but regardless. We do have spiritual evidence in Matthew chapter 28 that Jesus Christ rose from the dead the third day, just like he said he would. And if that's not enough, we know that he appeared unto some of the disciples and showed him the hand, scars in his hands and the scars in his feet where he was crucified. So Jesus rose again, just like he said he would. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point? If not, we'll move on. Mom, do you still have that chart that I handed out last week? Okay, because we'll be making reference to that today. We are going to be looking more at prophecy this week, but we are going to look at it from the aspect of types and shadows in the Bible. If someone would please find Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Hebrews 10 1. And I'll read Proverbs 25 and verse 2. He, Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 2 states this. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. What does Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1 state? The law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually perfect. So the law having what? A shadow of good things to come. In the last couple of weeks you've heard me talk about numerology in the Bible, Bible numbers, and what this number means. You've heard the pastor preach about it, um, how seven is the number of perfection, eight is the number of the resurrection, three is the number of the trinity, two is the number of witness, forty is the number of trial and tribulation to test it. 
when we look at the Word of God, there are some things that aren't just right out in the open where he said, this is the way it is. Why? Because in all honesty, we sat down and God talked to us about spiritual things. We're not going to completely understand everything he's trying to tell us. How do we know that? Because Jesus himself spoke in heavenly stories with earthly meanings that we call parables. Why? Because he was trying to take a heavenly concept or spiritual things and break it down to the level of the listener. Because if he would have placed it right out there in the open, they never would have grasped it. They never under, would have understood what he was talking about. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1 that the law was a shadow of good things to come. Well, there are other things in the Bible that are shadows, are types, that point to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we go back to the probably one, if we go back to those things that we hear about at Christmas time, how many wise men were there? Three. We don't know how many there were. Parents, who you listen to? The Bible doesn't state a number. Go ahead and read that Bible, Dennis. You ain't gonna find a number on there on how many wise men came to visit Jesus. I can, I can write it in. Oh, that's how you use the Bible, and you don't want to do that. But where do we get the number of three, or the misconception of the number of three wise men being there? Because of the three gifts. The three gifts. And what are the gifts? Frankincense and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, if we go back to the Old Testament, and we study out the tabernacle, we would find several things. First thing we would find is everything about the tabernacle points to Christ. It all points to him. And we start breaking it down, you're going to find objects that are made of wood and gold that represent Jesus Christ and the fact that he was 100% man, man, represented by the wood. That's corruptible. But also, the gold represents deity, so it shows that he was 100% God. There are objects like the gold candlesticks that were pure gold. And with it being pure gold, it pointed directly to the deity of Jesus Christ. So when we look at gold being one of the gifts that the wise men brought, we find that it's kind of perfect in the way that it kind of reveals to us that Jesus Christ was 100% God. He was deity wrapped in the flesh. If someone would please find Exodus chapter 25, 31 and 32. Exodus, 35, uh, Exodus 25, 31 and 32. And someone else find Exodus 25, verses 10. Well, we're not. We won't cover it for the last one. I'll just mention it in passing with the verses. But Exodus chapter 25, 31 through 32. So the candlestick was made of pure gold. It was 100% gold. And it pointed to Christ in his divinity as the light of the world. If we look at the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 to 22, we find that it was made of wood overlaid with gold. As we've already said this morning, there were pieces of the furniture in the tabernacle that were wood overlaid with gold. The wood represented Christ being 100% man. The gold represented him being 100% God or 100% deity. So when we go back to the gifts of the wise men brought, we find that they're already pointing to who Christ was and what his duty on this earth was. Or I should say what his future held on this earth. Gold representing him being God in the flesh. God on the earth. Now we move on to the next one, which is frankincense. If someone will please find Exodus chapter 30, verse 34, I'll find Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. <coughs> And Galvin, these 
sweet spices with pure frankincense and wheat shall there be like a weight. So we find that frankincense was mixed with other spices in the tabernacle for use in ceremonial offerings. We find this also in Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord called unto Moses, oh, and when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour, pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon, and he shall bring it to Aaron's son, the priest, and he shall take thereout his handful of the flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So frankincense was used in the ceremonial offerings. What, were the, what was the purpose of the ceremonial offerings? Remember, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 said that uh, the law was a shadow of good things to come. So what is the shadowing? What are the offerings shadowing? What are the offerings of the tabernacle pointing to? What was the purpose of the offerings of the tabernacle? I know there were multiple purposes, but there's one I'm sure that sticks out amongst them all. What did Adam allow to come into this world? Sin. Sin. The offerings dealt mostly, or at least partly, with the sins of mankind. So when we look at the sacrifices, frankincense is pointing to Christ being the sacrificial lamb of God who would die for the sins of the world. So and we, you're, you're saying the offering was for sin of the, of the, of the people? Some of the offerings in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, in the temple, were for the sins of the people. Yes. So you're saying you had to give an offering. Am I getting this right? You did, every time you sin, you are mean you're sin. You had to pay with an offering. It wasn't quite that simple. If you sin today, and today was the day for the sin sacrifice, and you went out and sin tomorrow, you couldn't go back to the temple and just offer another sacrifice. You had to wait a whole year before you could come back. But those things. Those laws that we read about, that everyone loves to read about, in Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus, they're all things that point to Jesus Christ, his death, and his resurrection, and who he is as the Son of God. So when we're looking at the sin sack, at the offerings, they're pointing to Christ as him being the ultimate sin offering for all of mankind. Without reading it, I'm sure we could probably quote what John the Baptist said in John chapter 1 and verse 29. What did John the Baptist declare Christ as when he was coming to be baptized? He said that, but how did he describe him? Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And what did the Holy Ghost say about, uh, record about Jesus Christ in Revelation 13 and verse 8? Revelation 13, 8. If someone wants to go ahead and read. So what is Jesus Christ? The last part there. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If we talk about lambs, which we will be here in a little bit in the Old Testament, what were lambs used for that when they were singled out? Sacrifice. sacrifice. And why were they sacrificed? For the sins of the man, of people. So when we look at Jesus Christ in frankincense, it points to the sacrificial offerings that take us directly to Christ and his purpose on this earth, which was to die for the sins of mankind. What about myrrh? What was myrrh used for? In Exodus chapter 20 
in verse 23. I'll go ahead and read that. If someone finds Esther chapter 2 and verse 12. Esther 2, 12. Exodus 30 and verse 34. The Bible states, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, uh, stacta, and onca, and galvanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense of each there shall be like weight. And what about Esther chapter, oops, and I read the wrong verse. 23. Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels. And what does Esther chapter 2 and verse 12 state? So we know that myrrh was used in ceremonial cleansing. But it was also used at one point in the life of Christ. Actually more than one point. What does Mark chapter 15 verse 23 state? So they offered him wine mingled, mingled with myrrh when he was hanging on the cross. When we look at myrrh, there and all the way back in the nativity, it was pointing to the fact that Christ would die and be buried someday. I know that's not a great revelation because unless Christ comes back, we're all going to die and be buried someday, probably more than likely. However, myrrh was specific in the death and burial of Jesus Christ because we find that they were using it as a pain medicine there on the cross to try to quench his thirst a little bit, but he refused it. But also the fact that when it comes to the Jewish tradition, when they went to bury the body, they would have buried the spices, the body using spices, but myrrh would have also been mixed in with that as well. So point, Mark points to the fact that Christ would have died, but he also would have been um, buried. So myrrh was an herb. Myrrh's more along the line, I think, of a spice. Spice. And we know that it was used to prepare Christ's body for burial, we're in John chapter 19 and verse 39. John 1939. Okay, someone will go ahead and read that page. Passover. 
If we go to the Old Testament, God ordained Passover or commanded to be celebrated on the 14th day of the Hebrew month Nisan, which was also known as Abib before the Babylonian captivity, which puts us in the time frame of April to March. We find this in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 2. Exodus 12, 2. And verse 6. And I'll find Leviticus chapter 23. And verse 5. Does someone have Exodus chapter 12, verse 2 and 6? This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole sum of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at even is the Lord's Passover. If we go back to the passage which Mom read in Exodus chapter 12, we find that the Hebrews were getting ready to come out of bondage. They were getting ready to leave Egypt. It's the night when the death angel would pass. And God begins establishing Passover. And Passover centers around one animal. You want to guess what that is? It centers around the lamb. And without the lamb, you cannot pass over, uh, celebrate Passover. It is impossible because it all is centered around that one animal. And God required the Hebrews to eat three spe uh, specific foods on that night of Passover in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 8. Let me jump back to Exodus 12, 8. Of course, Exodus chapter 12 is the institution of Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, in verse 8, the Bible reads, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. So, God required the Passover to require the Hebrews to eat three specific foods on the night of Passover. The, la the lamb, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs. When we study Passover in itself, it points to the death of Jesus Christ. When we look at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it points to the burial of Jesus Christ. Isn't it, I hate to say a little funny, but or ironic, but isn't it a little bit ironic that the feast that points to the death of Jesus Christ comes right before the feast that points to the burial of Jesus Christ? And they are all at the same time. You go in from Passover to the next day in the beginning, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now when we look at that Passover lamb in a little bit more detail, the lamb in symbolizes or is symbolic or pointing to Jesus Christ. How do we know that it is pointing to Jesus Christ? What did John the Baptist cry out? We've already stated it earlier. The Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. If we go to Revelation chapter 4, and they're trying to find out who is worthy, what did John say he saw in the midst come out to take out with the book? A lamb. How did God describe Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8? We've already read that one this morning as well. The Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. 
And the, this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto we do well that ye take heed as unto the light that shineth in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star rises in your heart. But as we look at the word of God and study it in detail, we find that the Lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ. The Lamb was symbolic of Christ's meekness. We find this in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. What does Isaiah 53, 7 state? I'll read Acts chapter 8. So we once again have a reference to Christ as a lamb, the Messiah as a lamb, but it points to his meekness. He opened not his mouth. And Acts chapter 8 and verse 32 states, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a, as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened not his mouth. When we go back to the Passover, they could not fought, take out just any lamb. But it had to be a specific lamb. It had to be a lamb without spot and without blemish. If we go back, if we go farther in the Old Testament to the minor prophets, we find Christ rebuking the Israelites and the Hebrews because they were not following this. They were just offering the worst of the worst, the blind, the maimed. That's not what God wanted. God gave very specific instructions when it came to the lamb that was set aside for the Passover. You're saying it had to be the prize-winning lamb. It had to be the prize-winning lamb. Is what I get. And we find this in Exodus now, chapter. Let me ask you a question here. Why, 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 out of all the animals, why does he pick the lamb? Because that's the. Oh. Uh, you, you know, did he, did he say that? I mean, I don't know. I've never seen it in scripture. But why does he favor the lamb? Because that's how he described Jesus Christ. That's the animal that he chose. The lamb. The lamb. Gentle. Is that what you mean by that? When it comes to Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection and his ministry on the earth as a prophet, it is described as a lamb. And we find this in that the lamb had to be without spot or blemish. We find this in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 5. Exodus 12, 5, if someone wants to read that. And 1 Peter 1.19. I'll go ahead and read 1 Peter. Does somebody have Exodus chapter 12 and verse 5? So it had to be a lamb without spot and without blemish. If we turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, I'll read that. You don't have to turn there. You see your notes. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot or blemish. So when we look at the Passover lamb, it had to be without spot, without blemish. It had to be within the first year of its life, which means that lamb would have been in its prime. It would have been prime. And Jesus Christ, we find in 1 Peter was first, uh, 1 Peter 1.19, he had no spot, he had no blemish. And when we look at Jesus Christ dying, if we, we start studying out Jewish custom, do you know what the perfect what the Jews consider the perfect age of a man to be? What do you mean by that? What do you mean? What's the definition of perfect? Perfect age of a man. What did the Jews? Prime or? Yep, when he was in his prime. What at what age did? I would say thirty. I gotta add three more years to it. Thirty-three. The Jews believe that the perfect age of a man, uh, the prime age of a man, is thirty-three. And when did Jesus Christ die? Thirty-three. When he was thirty-three. Oh, see why I get all these problems. And when we look at this, it also points to the fact. That Jesus Christ was innocent. It was that perfect age. And also, as we go farther along, 
we find that the Passover lamb should be brought out from the amongst other lambs. It was to be kept separate. In basic words, this lamb that the Jews would select to be the Passover lamb became their pet. They came in with them, they lived with them, they took care of it. They kept an eye on it. They made sure that there was no spot, no wrinkle. They made sure that it didn't have uh, a blemish. It wasn't, um, it didn't have a lazy eye, or maybe it, its hoof didn't act a little funny. Whatever it was, they made sure that it was perfect. There was no flaw in it. We find that the same was true of Jesus Christ. If somebody would read Isaiah, well, let's go with Luke chapter 3 and verse 4. Luke 3 and 4. Christ. 
But the blood was to serve as the salvation for the entire household. If you remember in Egypt, they took the blood of the lamb and they applied it to the doorpost of the household. And everyone that was within that household was saved. This typifies salvation for each one of us, how we need to apply the blood of Christ to the quote-unquote doorpost of each one of our own hearts. But we know that this was true of Christ, that he died for the household of mankind, and he died for the salvation of all. There are many verses that back that up, John 1.29, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Hebrews 9.28, and the list goes on and on, and you have all that. We're going to quickly speed through the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread symbolized the absence of sin and represented the purity of the sacrifices. When we look at unleavened bread, what is the key ingredient that's missing to make it leavened bread? Yeast. Yeast. And what does yeast uh, typify, symbolize in the Bible? It typifies sin. When you read the Word of God, Book of Psalms, yeast symbolizes sin. And without, and when we look at the Feast on Leavened Bread, it was to be without sin. It was purged. It was pure. When we look at this feast, it represents the purity of the sacrifice. We find in 1 Corinthians um, 5, verses 5 and 8, um, where yeast, or Bible refers to as leaven, symbolizes a sin. Purge ye out the old leaven. And then we come to the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs symbolize the pain and suffering of the Passover lamb. When you ate into them, there was no pleasant thing about them. They were bitter. They were sour. They symbolized what it was going to go through. When we look at Isaiah 53 and verse 4, we know that Jesus Christ took our pain and our suffering upon himself. We do not have to taste of the bitter sting of sin. We don't have to taste of the penalty of it if we've accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And when I say the penalty of it, I am talking about eternal separation from Jesus Christ. Because as long as we are in this mortal body, we will deal with the penalty of sin. We will deal with the penalty of the curse. We're going to get old. We're going to have aches. We're going to have pain. Um, maybe there's a genetic disorder in your family and you inherit it. Does that mean that God doesn't love you? Does that mean that God's punishing you? No. Those things are sometimes just a result of sin. And because of sin, our bodies have been decaying for a little over 6,000 years. It has nothing to do with because we are saved now, we're going to be perfect in every way. Because this body is still dying. It's still experiencing the effects of the curse. If you eat too much, guess what? You're going to get sick. And you can pray for healing. And maybe God will heal you. But if you go out and forge again tomorrow and you get sick again, that's not God's fault. That's because of the sin and you will overeat it. It's part of the penalty of sin. And if you don't take care of this body, you're going to pay for it. A bitterness of a lamb would symbolize the pain and suffering and pass over the lamb. Not necessarily, because that's not what was used in Passover. We're going back to what God instituted in the Passover and seeing how it points to Christ. You cannot just take anything and say, well, this is um, bitter and say it points to Christ. We are looking at the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? What does it really point to? We have verses backing that up. We're not just taking this all out of context. Because when you get things out of context, that's when the Bible is no longer the Bible. You get preachers preaching any way of a doctrine. And then we're all led astray because we don't know the truth or what's up from down. Anybody have any thoughts, any questions they want to add as we wrap this up? Okay. Let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there is none like you, Lord. Even right now we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels about the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and minds will be plowed, that they be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives, Lord, and be transformed even farther into your image. Lord, may we be submissive and obedient to your voice, that whatsoever you do say, we do. 
that we change in whatever way you desire, Lord, that we may be even farther transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would be sensitive to your spirit. We pray, Lord, even right now, I'm with the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the string of instruments, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing. And with the pastor, as he brings forth your word today, give him a special blessing as well. And with his mind and his lips, that your words would flow forth, Lord. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh yeah, they got my medicine down for four days or two. I don't expect you to.